What's up, guys? Welcome to the first ever episode 53 of the Kind of Funny Games cast. Nailed it. He does yeah. it every time. Every single time. I like As it. always, I'm Tim Geddes, joined by the coolest dudes in video games, Colin Moriarty and Greg Miller. And for the first time ever, we are joined by the one and only Steve Gaynor. Hey, everybody. This is exciting. <laughs> Today's going to be a fun show. I just Greg, talked to Greg for two yeah. solid hours. This is going to be but, the new hotness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're all, we got all you're the You're loose now. You got all the bad stuff out, all the junks out of your system. That's now true. you're here to throw gold. I Throwing spewed the junk all the over you, and now we're good to go. That was, But that wasn't on camera. Don't worry. <laughs> Remember, the Gone Home cast is up right now yes. on YouTube.com slash kind of funny games. Spoilers started an hour and 15 minutes. It's so true. You an hour and 15 minutes oh, wow. in, that's so when we start spoiling Gone Home. You're good for an hour and 15, and then... Stop. Yeah, and but I promised then, I don't know the topics. Yeah, you don't. We're talking about Tacoma today, right? Yes, we are. Good, because I promised that we would talk about Steve's new game, Tacoma, on this good. show. Good. Okay. Very good. That'll okay. be topic See what three. I, did there? I tied it together. They call it the kind of funny cinematic universe. Yeah. <laughs> I want that to be a thing one day. And I the think we're edging KFC. closer the, and closer The KFCU? To that. No, that's yeah. Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> University, <laughs> homie. <laughs> Ladies McDonald's and gentlemen, this is the Kind of Funny Games cast where every week we sit together, talk about video games and all the cool stuff going on. You can get it early at patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames, or you can get it late at youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames. Either way, we support you supporting us, <laughs> and I like that a lot. Today, the first topic is one that we haven't done in a while. What are you playing right now? Mm. We just had winter break, whatever that means to different people. Probably didn't mean much to you. you I was actually, working. Yeah, was you working. were working. We all were working in different ways. Well, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just lying ways, around doing nothing because <laughs> working in a particular. <laughs> so I just want to know what what kind of what kind of games you were playing. My favorite game uh, that I played over the holiday break was Chain Smoking in Las Vegas, which was my favorite. You understand that that particular game that I like to play. Uh, in terms of in terms of video games. Uh, I played th I've played three games recently that I'll talk a little bit about. Mm, dude. The first one it's overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, people have been busting balls about Metal Gear Solid Five, so I started finally really getting into that. I played it for about ten hours. Um, and we talked. What did we talk about this? What did we talk? That's Colin and Greg. We, we talk talked about, about this on the last games cast. Oh, the last games last cast. But well, you didn't okay. go into detailed thought. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah, I won't. I don't. I won't belabor that because I want to talk about the other games more. But it's a Metal Gear game for two hours. I enjoyed the, or not even, I enjoyed the very, the beginning. I think it's fucking awesome. Uh, and then it turned into an, a game I didn't really want to play. So, whoa, um, that's kind of backwards from, I think a lot of people's experience. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, Colin Welcome to Colin. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's just, it's so you uh, really loved like just a driven experience and you didn't want to be in the open world. Yeah. It's it. just not what I'm looking for with Metal Gear. I, I, I uh, as I said, I think on the okay. last games cast, it's appreciate the aesthetic, uh, value, you know, the, the, the production values, the aesthetics, great, uh, I like the depth of it. I think that, that there's something you know, Peace Walker-esque about the yeah. game, obviously. Yeah. Um, just not what I'm looking for in a Metal Gear game. And I don't think it's the epitome of gameplay that like, that that people talk about it as it is. I think, as I said on the previous one, I think there's there's many examples of third-person shooters that feel better. So it's... it's to which all the comments go, it's a stealth game. Okay. It could be, <laughs> just, just, it could be just, whatever you want Just it to saving be. them the trouble of it putting be, it below this It could be whatever you want it to be. I did love, as I said, I loved that loop of uh, clearing things out, being very silent until you, know, you found after 45 minutes, you fucking wanted to throw your controller out the window. <laughs> um, but So I appreciate it. It's there. I wanted to give it a go, but it's not a game I have any interest in going what back to. What is your favorite Metal Gear Solid game? Two. Okay. Right. Colin, welcome. Let's this move is on. A thing. <laughs> uh, and then, so the other games, the other two games I was messing around with... Uh, I never got through it. I'm a huge fan of Wolfenstein, The New Order. I think the game's fucking cool as hell. Yeah. Um, so I went and I earlier this year, May or whatever it was, the old blood came out, the DLC, and I got like halfway through it and then I just stopped playing it. Um, so I just deleted my save and started playing it again and I got about halfway through it and, and <laughs> still and haven't beaten it yet. Uh, but I just, I really love machine games. I fucking love those guys. Like, I, I just think they understand the story-driven first-person shooter. I think the game feels great. I think it's it's not quite on Call of Duty's level in terms of the way maybe it feels, but it's pretty close. Um, you know, to me, that is the high watermark of shooters uh, in terms of gameplay. Um, were, were you a fan of um, uh, Riddick? Uh, and, I, I played Riddick back. I, I played Riddick back on Xbox, the original right. Xbox. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was the last Riddick I played because I think there's been like one or two since then that, right. that I did not fuck with. Yeah, that game was. <laughs> 
That game was awesome. Yeah. Back in and, the day. And, oh, yeah. and the darkness I thought was really, really good. And that was, I think, the core team that went yep. off to form machine games. Yep. So yeah, no, I mean those those guys know what they're doing. Yeah. For sure. And it's I'm excited to see like what you know, clearly they'll probably do another Wolfenstein. I think that's gonna be great. So, so I, I was messing around with that. I recommend that. I, I I just I haven't gotten through it because I'm so meticulous about getting collectibles in games because I'm mm. a moron that <laughs> uh that like I just really have to like go and like you do every little thing. And I still love their emphasis uh, on the dream sequences in those games, like I, I, I think it's so fun. And I don't know if you play them, or whatever. When you find the beds in the in the game, and, and you then can play you, an original Wolfenstein, yeah, and level it's like a nightmare. It. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, that's so. Oh, I love that idea. Uh, the third game that I know is a little bit old for people that have played on Xbox One or PC, but I just we just got codes for it. And I just started playing as the Banner Saga. Um, oh, okay, which is cool as hell. Again, it's 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 a little obtuse in some of its mechanics. Um, uh, Story's a little confusing. It's very like Norris, and and it's you know so some of the names are a little confusing. It's hard to keep up with like who's who. But I do like the 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 combat in terms of there being like an armor class and a and a strength class, and you have to damage them both in order to whittle these enemies down. I think it's quite clever and quite deep. Um, if you basically like if your armor if the enemy's armor is above your attack, then there's a ten percent chance per point above your attack that they will block your attack. So you have to whittle their armor down first. I think it's like really. Super clever, yeah. And then, but um, you can still get lucky and and get a hit on right. them, even if their armor is really high. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's all there's a bunch of choices. Like, I uh, not there's no permadeath in the game in battle, but there's permadeath in the choices you make around the battles. Um, and I had this one instance where I like tried to save. You know, this girl was under attack, and I did the wrong thing, and she's she's gone. Like she's just gone yeah. from the story. Um, so I I, I was I, I dig it a lot. Um, it reminds me that you know what we talked about with Final Fantasy Tactics, which I think is one of the great games of all time, or Tactics Ogre, especially Let Us Cling Together uh, on PSP, which is a fantastic fucking game. We need more of these. Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem. Come Although on. I don't, I Fire Emblem is a similar game, but I just don't feel like in a similar way to the Banner Saga, it's it's not all the way what I want. Fire Emblem's even further away from what I'm really looking for. I'm really interested in why that is. Like I wonder yeah. what it <laughs> Did is. Did you play about the 3DS Fire one? Yeah, the, the 3DS. Okay. Uh, yeah, I played it for five hours or so. Yeah. It's just... Um, I thought that was really great. But I I'm, love it. I'm, I'm also not like a hardcore Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Go guy. So. It's just one of those... It's the same thing with Disgaea where I'm just like, this is not what I want. Like, I, I, I want this very specific square soft at sure. style. And I mean square soft back, like old style, you know, even advanced uh, and advanced two or whatever on, on GBA and DS, I think was like way more aligned with what I want. I don't know quite how to explain it. Fire Emblem mm -hmm. just doesn't resonate with me at all. Here, like, okay, I, here, here's a question. Yeah. Did, speaking of Metal Gear, did you play Metal Gear Acid or Metal Gear Acid 2? On PSP, no, I didn't. You should. So Metal Gear Acid 1 was a little like they were trying to figure it out. Metal Gear Acid 2 is fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. I played a little bit of Acid as a huge Metal Gear fan on the original and never bothered with 2. No, 2, it's like really rare. They did it. They didn't ship a lot. It didn't do well. I think you can only get it on UMD. Like you have to yeah. track it down or whatever. Um, but I played all the way through that game. They figured out the gameplay. It's really interesting. Like smart card based tile based tactics uh, game and like just a good wacky like Metal Gear side story. Um, so track it down. I think you. I think you would actually really like Metal Gear Acid Two. It, like, <laughs> it, sound, it, sound, it sounds like it, would, it sounds like it would hit like. The thing yeah, scratch, that you're talking about. Yeah, scratch that itch. Because it is it is a very specific itch because it's not just strat like turn based strategy role playing games I like. Like I played this guy and I appreciate it. People love those games. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is absurd. Like this is not even remotely what I'm looking for. Even though aesthetically it looks like it could be a, a new yeah, Final Fantasy exactly. tactics. Well, this guy is different though, because that's kind of a never ending thing. Like yeah, this, and know. it's also like stacking enemies on the same tile, you're doing billions of points of damage. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like a parody in a lot of ways. But like tactics, especially like War of the Lions on PSP, which I think is the epitome of that, you know, the nice translation and and all that is just I don't understand how they how Square doesn't understand that they can make that game again yeah. and sell it even for sixty dollars if they really wanted to. They don't have to upgrade. Valkyria Chronicles is probably like the closest thing that oh, you yeah. know, that that anyone has gotten. But these these, I don't know. It's just it, 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 Banner Saga is good in its own right, and I recommend it. Uh, so far from what I played, I played it for you know mm -hmm. four hours last night. I actually played it for a few hours, went to bed, started reading about. One way trips to Mars, Kevin. That's what we, you know, we were talking about that today. And then I just got back out of bed and played it again because mm. I was just—it was just on my mind. So, um, so I recommend it. But it reminds me of what I really want. It's like right. almost there. Yeah, you know? but it is exceptionally beautiful. It is. It has that incredibly beautiful, like kind of mid-century, uh, you know, cinematic animation mm -hmm. style to it. Like all, just like the the color palettes and stuff are gorgeous. It's pretty. It's pretty to look at. I like <laughs> it. So that's what I've been uh, messing around with. Cool. What about you, Greg? 
Well, are we trying to cover holiday break and what we played during yeah, holiday sure. break? Do we do holiday I mean, break? We did that on the the last episode, but like, if you want to expand on anything, like most of my stuff is just expansions on that stuff. So. Okay, so I ran through the Batman Arkham Knight DLC, got all the trophies in that. I was very excited. I like trophy, Steve Gainer. You might not know this about me. What color me. trophy did you? Get? I prefer platinums because again, platinums signify the game's real. And when a downloadable game releases without a platinum, everybody's like. What is this? If Taco Master could have a platinum, <laughs> clearly Game of the Year 2013 should have one. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Went through, did all the Batman DLC. I really like the Season of Infamy uh, stuff they added there with Mr. Freeze and Ra's al Ghul and all those things. More, it's what I think I, I, when I started it, I expect to find it under the Arkham episodes, you know, where they put all the other DLC content. In reality, it was jump back into your game, and it's just another tab of side missions now with their own little wheel to expand on, which we always talk about how smart that is. I uh, jumped in, did all of those. Then I went through and did all the rest of the Batmobile challenges, all the combat challenges for all the different characters and stuff. Had a great time. Uh, loved it. it. Really, you know, a lot of silver trophies, a lot of rewarding rewarding things. Mm-hmm. It was fun to run around as Ben Affleck Batman. See that and in, in, have That's the great. they did that they they added yeah ben the Batman v Superman suit got added long ago now but okay. this is the first like story content to jump in and use it with and I love that you have the t shirt now I do I have my I got my Batman v Superman shirts today I'm very excited to wear yeah, them it's gonna be great so yeah. it's like the it's like the robot Batman suit no no not okay. that one okay, just the okay. one with the right. you know the, the, he's a stockier Batman sure. the big S on the chest small okay. ears yeah, yeah yeah so I did that um played Bastion on Vita. Got my first game play playthrough out of the way. Got to start. I've started the new game plus, but I got to mm-hmm. commit to it. But we have some more trips coming up, so that's part of that. Along with volume, which finally mm-hmm. came to Vita, but I haven't started. Yeah, got to download that on Vita. Yeah, yeah my very, trip tomorrow. Very stoked about it. Uh, Bastion still is awesome. Still amazing. Still yeah. love that game. Uh, excited to platinum it because it'll definitely be one I'll chip away at over and over again. I know the challenge rooms are going to be tough later on because again, platinum signify that they're real games. Even old games can have platinum. See, like Bastion. Just letting you know. Just, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you patch in a DLC platinum trophy. Um, what else then? Oh, Life is Strange was the big one. Life oh, is yeah. Strange. Did you I, finish the whole season? And I platinumed it. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that even games starring teen girls? Yeah, who are platinum? going? <laughs> even games starring teen My girls God. going through growth and personal change, they can have platinums as well. Wow. Life is Strange was totally awesome. Like I said in the Game of the Year episode last year, if I or last year last episode, if I had played that and had enough time to digest it, I think it would have definitely hit on my top ten list of the year. Mm-hmm. But I played it late. I was late to the party, so there you go. But I highly recommend it. Totally enjoyed it. Thought the story was really intriguing, and that's what I think threw me is the fact that playing through episode one when it first came out i was just playing it and it's like oh cool like she has the ability to rewind time or whatever and then at the end there's like this bit not twist but like big thing that sets up of it but it seemed out of place whereas in context of all five at yeah. once you're like oh this makes sense and i'm and now i know these people because like even ending that first episode like i didn't have like super strong feelings about victoria or this person or that person and then by the time you get through episode two it's like i'm in this world and i love this person i hate this person i want to know this and that, <laughs> i don't trust him you know what i mean like yeah. i wanted to see where all that was going and it pays off really well really great character piece mm-hmm. in terms of talking to everybody and then you know getting to make choices which i'm always a big fan of yeah uh most recently one i'm excited because this is a fresh piece of hotness I'm breaking off for you oh, right now. Because by the time wow. this posts, my embargo will be up. Mm. I've been playing Oxenfree. Uh, are you, I'm anyone? really looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I, I've, I've been seeing a lot of, like, I'm, I'm excited because I just, I feel like I just started seeing a lot of hits for that, like, maybe like a month ago, something yeah. like that. People seem like they're getting their hands on it and are, are really excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying it. I feel my problem is that the bar was set too high over the weekend. I ran and hung out with some people, and it was that classic, oh, this game's awesome. If it had been released this year, it might have been my game of the year. And I'm like, holy shit. Oh, fuck. You know, I yeah. sit down and play it, and I'm playing a pre-release build, so I've run into a few bugs and stuff where I've had to restart things, and it's like, ugh. And it's, so it's like screwing up the pacing, I okay. feel like, of what's supposed to be happening. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. The story's super interesting. Do you guys know anything about it? No. I don't really know very much about it. It's an indie game. You play as this girl, Alex. You go to this island, which I guess in in this part of town, or, you know, this town they live in, right? All the juniors go out to the island and party and drink their faces off and have, like, this big, you know, crazy Well, what is it? Like, what kind of game? <laughs> no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm setting I, I it like, up. I like the face with that. Yeah, yeah. What the <laughs> fuck <laughs> is it? Um, is it a side-scroller? No. I mean, is it open world? No, you're getting colder. It is... 
is it top a, down? Is no. it a racing game? Is it a racing, racing game? game. <laughs> <laughs> Race yourself to the island. Isometric? No, it, it's adventure game, 2D. You walk mm. up. You can go up things. Like, there's trails. You're you're in this, like, forest preserve wilderness, right? So you get to drop but off. It, but it's a 2D adventure game. Out of town. Exactly, okay. yeah. You walk up. You click on things. You do things. Okay. There's a radio you have to play with all the time and mm. do different things with. I don't want to ruin the game for you. But... Uh, yeah, you you go to this island, going to party it off. You get there. Not a lot of the other kids have come or whatever, so it's just you and this small group that you're going to party with or whatever, but there's all these personal relationships already that are, you're, as the, you know, there's a, a new brother she has, a new stepbrother who's, like, hanging out with her for the first time, so he's kind of, like, the entree that we learn everybody's, you know, kinks and you know, how they're all connected to each other thing, right. and then start expanding on it. and then there's this thing where everything gets crazy, mm -hmm. and so then now it's like, even with like, ah, oh God, I got uh, this door, I think this door should open, and it's not opening, because I think something's wrong, I'll restart it, and I play through, and there, the door open fine, which is not wow. going to be in the retail build, you right, assume, right, right. to be very clear, uh, even with like the little hiccups, I'm like, fuck, I want to keep playing this, and it's not sp supposedly that long, you know, yeah. I was trying to play through it last night, and I was like, Getting up to like, oh, it was like midnight, and we're coming off of as recording this, the live stream where I'm exhausted. So it was like, I could power through this, but I'm gonna be garbage yeah, <laughs> all day yeah. today. <laughs> so I stopped. I'm looking forward to beating it tonight and seeing what's happening because the story is super interesting and I wanna mm -hmm. know. And there's clearly something happening with like other players in it. It's not multiplayer, but like, you, I, other, there's something going on. There's a lot of what the fuck's going on in this game. I'm excited to beat it to find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really where we're going with that one. I like That's the vibe awesome. that I've seen from it. Like, yeah, it, art it just, style's awesome. Yeah, Voice acting's really good. Yeah. You know, you're walking in and like you're interacting with the characters and then like your your you know, your word choices pop up. So you have three above your head and then X is always action. Or I'm using a PlayStation controller, but you can use whatever one you want to. It's Xbox One PC, by the way. Uh and then you choose it and then it goes, and then you it's branching dialogue and you start going and having all these different conversations and mm. people seeing you differently or so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's exciting. I like it. I think I think the bar was set too high, and I'm worried about reviews doing that when the time mm -hmm. comes. You know what I mean? Then mm -hmm. they come out there, and it is this game's getting amazing scores, and I don't know if that sets it. And my, but again, it could just be me having a bad experience with it. Yeah, because I'm also then you know sitting on my bed playing on my laptop, being like, why isn't this on a fucking mm -hmm. console? Why don't I get a goddamn console? <laughs> be like a schmuck. <laughs> no Steam. I don't care that fr some friend just signed on. No, that doesn't happen oh. on the other consoles. Yeah, I've never seen that. On I that know console. how to turn it off on the other consoles. You I don't can understand. Turn it off Steam. <laughs> I don't know how. It's called Google. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what about you? Uh, so I've been playing a lot of Gone Home on Xbox One and PlayStation Four. Uh, no, we've, I've been I've been spending a lot of time testing, fixing, getting that stuff through cert. Um, but and it's out right now. Uh, in the time that I've had, when we haven't been having to firefight various things, um, I picked up. Rainbow Six Siege oh. when they did a free weekend on on PC. Um, somebody who I knew who had it. No, actually, I got a code from somebody on Twitter who had like an extra one because it was like a referral thing, whatever. So I have never been like a massive fan of the Rainbow Six series. Like I, I've played a number of them. I, I, I did like uh, Rainbow Six Vegas on 360 and... Um, but you know, I'm I'm not like a hardcore like old school like I played the original Rainbow Six a million hours. Um, <laughs> but I did play SWAT Four, uh, which was an uh, international game from between System Shock Two and Bioshock, and it was like similarly like a squad based. You go into this place, you have to like deal with the terrorists and like rescue hostages and all that kind of stuff. So I had seen stuff about Rainbow Six Siege, and I thought it looked it looked cool. Like the things that are really emphasized in it are there you, you know you go into this facility it's like an office or like an embassy or a bank or a house or something and and the terrorists have hold themselves up inside and it really focuses on like environment destructibility so there's a whole lot of like you can you know repel up a wall and then bust in through a window and then send out your little like um your camera bot yeah, your robot to car. see where the, the terrorists are and they're all holed up in the next room but you don't have to go in through the door you can like put a charge on the wall and blow out the wall and get behind them and take mm. them all out before they know what's going on and so it's like very strategic in terms of like you can plan ahead you can scout the environment and then you can you like if you hear a guy underneath you you can just take out your machine gun and start firing into the floor and it you know blows a hole in the floor yeah. and you can take the guy out so there, like there was an awesome gift on reddit the other day right yeah. where uh they it came up to one of the boarded up doors and they always leave the bottoms unboarded or whatever right they drove his car in just as he came through and turned he got through the barbed wire he saw that two guys were just about to come through so he popped out came over with the machine and shot through the two planks and just like headshotted both of them without <laughs> being able to see them I was like, holy shit that That's was awesome, awesome. yeah 
Um, so there's a lot of moments like that. And I, I'm, I'm the reason I picked it up on the free weekend was because I had basically thought it was like pretty much like a multiplayer only game yeah. pretty much. And it is focused on multiplayer, but they have classic like offline. Well, not you have to be online. But they have single player terrorist mm. hunt where it's just like they spawn enemies and sometimes like a hostage or another objective in the space. And you as just a lone lone wolf go in and just like, yeah, very methodically, like try to find everybody, not let anybody get the drop on you, you know, repel up to the roof and then down the other side and come in through the window. And like um, it really gave me that feeling of like that SWAT four feeling of like, okay, like I'm, I'm just going to have to really like take this one step mm. at a time and be very intentional about how I approach this problem. And it was really hard. That was one thing is like, it's, it's tuned for being co-op even in that mode. So when you play it single player, it's really hard at first. And it was cool to play it over the course of the holiday break and just feel myself getting better at it over time. Mm. Because it's like, you have to learn how the AI is going to act. You have to learn how they're going to react when you start shooting, you know, or when you X, Y, Z, you know, you're, you're sort mm -hmm. of like, okay, I can be better at this. Cause I know these guys are going to like swarm me if I do this. So I need to like be ready for it, you know, or even like learning to read the environment. Cause like in, in hostage, uh, uh, extraction mode, um, part of the game is like, you don't know where the hostage is. So part of it is like, you got to scout and try to find the hostage. And at some, you know, when you start out, you're like, I guess I just have to go in every room and see if they're in there. And then after a while you start to notice like, wait, they always fortify the area where the hostage is going to be. And so you, then you start scouting. You're like, Oh, there's a lot of barbed wire here. Mm. So that probably means the hostage is like past this barbed wire. Oh yeah. They put up some shields. Okay. This has got to be where he is, you know, and, and you kind of are learning how to be effective at the game. And now I'm, I have a pretty good, like rate of like just finishing a mission solo mm -hmm. when I when I started and that was super not true at the you beginning. Rescue and motherfuckers left and right. Yep. Uh, and yeah, and and it's it's cool when you when you do rescue a hostage solo. You know, you 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 can only use your sidearm, and so you're like carrying them out with you. And it there's some really cool moments where you're like you're guiding the hostage, and then a guy pops out around a corner. You just like use your sidearm, take him out. And it just feels like really harried. You're probably at like a quarter health at that point because you've taken a couple of hits. So anyway. I, I've enjoyed that game a whole lot at this point. It's cool. It's scratching an itch as, oh, as it was. Oh. You know, those squad-based first-person yeah. tactical games, there's not a lot of them. And when you can get one that kind of does the version of it that you like, it's it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. Rainbow Six has like a certain draw. Siege, not, I mean, I, I only played Siege before it came out, and it was, it was fine. I, I don't... I. I 99 out of 100 times I don't want to play online anyway. Yeah. Uh, but Rainbow, I've said it before many times, Rainbow Six 3 when I was in college was like a way of life for yep. me and my friends. Like we yeah. we adored that game. I And like I used to say, and people that have listened to us for a long time know in Rainbow Six 3 in the single player, I used to kill my whole squad and play and play it by myself because <laughs> yeah. I thought it was more fun that way and harder that way. I was like really, really obsessed with that game. But by the time it came to Vegas and stuff, I just, I just wasn't... Uh, I was like totally off the, the wagon in terms of uh, in terms of multiplayer games, but I totally get it. Like there, it's even the same way with like watching people play Battlefront or something where it's like I, I get it. It's just not 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 the itch I have right yeah, now. Yeah, it's not um, what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So earlier, before we were doing the show, we we're talking about you playing Call of Duty. Call and there's something Duty. amazing yes. that I want you to tell everybody. So that's true. When when COD blops trace uh <laughs> as they call out. it internally yeah <laughs> uh, uh, when cb3 uh came out um earlier this year uh, i played it i played um the beginning of the of the single player campaign and so when i play some games i have found that there will be like a gore filter checkbox and i usually just try playing the game with that checked to see what it's like um and i actually played so i actually played through the entirety of um last of us with the gore filter oh, really? on and i liked it a lot because I, I did the whole game went back did it, and then i went back through i was like okay i'll start a new game and, and put on with normal gore and i'm like wow i'm the tone of this game feels a lot better to me when you aren't just seeing dudes heads get smashed in half and blood go everywhere. Like it, it has that sense of restraint that you're yeah. like, yeah, I get it. I fucking wasted that guy, but it's not like gratuitous, you know? And, yeah. and so I like, sometimes I just like to play games that way. Like here's a pro tip, the game limbo, Xbox 360, oh, yeah. and now PS4. It's everywhere. it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it came out like five years ago now or whatever, four years ago. Let me um, check if it has a platinum trophy. Put your phone it away, <laughs> Miller. Um, and, and so that game has a gore filter. That game is gory as fuck, man. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I played it from the beginning with the gore filter on. 
it is way better and way creepier with that turned on because what happens when like the spider tries exactly. To stab you or so here's what happens. So in the in the default game, you start it, you meet the spider, spider spears you, and then your body's on it. It's like Ugh, gross, you know. And then it ends. When you turn gore filter on, you're just standing there, and the spider goes, <laughs> and as soon as it touches you, it just cuts to black. And it's just like, mm. oh, like it's like you just imagine yeah. what just happened to you. And it's like just way spookier. Mm. So anyway, Damn. yeah, <laughs> like like pro pro tip. If you haven't played Limbo, start it up and try playing with Gore Filter on because it's like if it just feels like it fits with like how stark that game is. So anyway, Steve Gainer's Goreless Games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was playing, uh, yeah, the Blops 3. Um, and, uh, and so, and so at the beginning, when you're starting up, there's a checkbox that's, uh, that's graphic content and you can turn it off. Um, and so per this discussion, I was like, I'll try turning that off. Two amazing things. One, this one's the less surprising one. They, you know, turn off blood when you shoot a guy. Um, but they also blur out any like fucked up torture scenes or whatever. They're like in the scripted scenes, which is which gotcha. not that surprising. Right. But What's really good is that one of the very first things that happens in the game is you as a player, you go up, you you like interact with a console and you turn on these security cameras. And all the security cameras have fucked up torture happening on them. And in the scripted scene, they just zoom in on the camera. So it's the full screen. So one of the first things that happens in the game is just like giant pixels cover the entire <laughs> screen like this. And it's all you can see. Uh, and I'm like, nice. Good. Um, but the very good and extra funny thing is... They filter out all the swear words and they don't do it by just like bleeping them or muting them or something. They do it in network television TV edit nice. style. So all of them are like, if the guy was going to be like, these sons of bitches are flooding the, he's like, these sons of guns are coming for us. Yeah. <laughs> like, really? <dude? laughs> and just the whole game is that. And it's fantastic. We need to do a let's play of that. That's yes. hilarious. Yeah. It, it makes me really happy. Uh, I, I played I played a good amount of that game. Just just like, be like, <laughs> yeah, just like this this piece of junk. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I know what you said, dog. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I, I was really glad that was the creative decision they made. <laughs> That's awesome. I uh, haven't been playing too much. Again, a couple days ago we were talking about the what we played over the break. My biggest things were Amplitude mm. and Freedom Planet. Two games that I recommend very highly and if you don't know what they are, you should check them out. Specifically Freedom Planet. You probably know yeah, Amplitude Yeah, I know is. Amplitude, but I, yeah. I don't know about Freedom Planet. So Freedom Planet, Planet is... A, so I got, I got a little excerpt from Wikipedia about exactly what it is because I want people to get hyped on this. Okay. Hyped? So Freedom Planet is a two-dimensional platform video game created by independent developer Galaxy Trail, a studio set up for the project by designer Steven Diduro. So mm. it originally started as a, a fan-made Sonic game. So he was okay. making this, and uh, he wasn't. They weren't happy with like Sonic Four, Episode One and Two, and all that. They're like, we want to like everyone do else. right, exactly. Yeah, um, like the way uh, Fifty Shades of Grey started as a Twilight fan. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, the player controls <laughs> one of three <laughs> straight face. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> protagonists: the Dragon Lilac, the Wildcat Carol, or the Basset Hound Mila, aided by the okay. duck-like Torque. Okay. Torque's the homie. The, the player attempts to defeat the evil Lord Brevin. Blah blah blah. All this stuff. Evil Lord. Good. Now. While the game focuses on fast-paced platforming, its levels are inter interspersed with slower action scenes. Those slower action scenes are boss fights that are awesome. It's like, I don't know if you remember how cool the boss fights in Sonic the Hedgehog 3 were, Colin. I don't remember anything being cool in a Sonic game ever. The boss so fights in Sonic the Hedgehog 3 Whoa. were awesome. And they're right back here. <laughs> in this Shots, fired. Shots fired. Shots so, <laughs> fired. Eventually, he lost interest in creating a derivative work and reconceived the project as his, as his own thing. And he visited the website DeviantArt. I don't know if you've heard it. Oh, it has, it has a lot of connections to one Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. So I like that there's that sure connection. Does. And there. Shadow the Hedgehog. Oh, definitely. <laughs> any any hedgehog. There's probably some dick pics over there. Greg the Hedgehog. Um, and it got artist Zylo Zio Ling, who replaced the existing cast of characters with their own. So it's kind of like Sonic and Tails and Knuckles each have a thing. So they each have different play styles and stuff. Anyways, long story short, this fan project for Sonic then turned into its own 2D platformer that I would liken to being the Shovel Knight. So I'm it's to Nintendo what Freedom Planet is to Sonic or to Sega. Okay. And it's really cool because it's like it it looks and kind of I showed you earlier. Yeah. And uh, it looks like Sonic, you know, but it has all these like nice kind of just Sega isms about it. And just the music sounds very kind of like classic Genesis and like even with the Saturn, like it has there's a Knights level. 
like Ooh, Knights right, Inspired. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. So it's very, it's like it's a nice throwback, and I've just been playing through it, and it keeps getting better. The is pacing's it, a little weird. Is it on? Is it on? Is it like so PC only? It or was it? Steam. It came out last year, okay. um, and it just came out on the eShop on Wii U. Oh, okay. On in October. Okay. Wow. So definitely check it out. A couple people have been tweeting at me saying that they they played it after the stream, and they're like, "This is fucking <clears> awesome." So I. Highly what's, recommend it. What's the point? I mean, with all due respect, why are they stranding it on Wii U? Are they going to bring it to PS4 I don't know. and Xbox One? It, it, was a, it was a Kickstarter project, and then, you know... For that, was a, that was a goal or something? Like a uh, I, I don't know the, all of that, but I do know it just got on there. and They announced a Freedom Planet 2, so I'm assuming nah. that like they're trying yeah. to make this a thing. Um, but I don't know what the history is with Shovel Knight. Like, why was that on Wii U first, and then... Well, I think because it was an ode to Nintendo, but but they'd always had intentions of bringing it everywhere eventually. I think mm. it was also kind of because um, WayForward always had a strong connection to yeah, Nintendo true. and they came from WayForward, mm. the, the drift yeah, developers yeah, yeah. that yeah. did and everything. Yeah, Sean and those guys, I think <laughs> I think it was yeah them being true to their connections and them being true, I think, to the spirit of you know yeah. one of the great games of the last generation, of course. Yeah. So here's a question. To be fair, why is it called Freedom Planet? Is there a planet where everyone's free so on it? Is I'm there not a planet exactly that needs to be fighting sure. for the so freedom it's, of the planet. It's very okay. based, like the art style is it's like very old school Chinese kind of um just a Chinese an old Chinese look. So everything's very just like Like mythology. Just, yeah, yes, okay. exactly. Okay. That was the word I was looking for. And um it's cool because it it's not based on the Saturday morning Sonic cartoon, but it, it really kind of looks like it and the story of it has that same stupid like did you ever watch So, so you've got to go fast, you need chili dogs? Is yeah, this I, what I'm hearing? No, that's that's the the that, that was the other cartoon. That was the Saturday morning. <laughs> okay, sorry. There was two cartoons in the '90s for Sonic. This is too deep of Sonic '90s cartoon lore for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, two, so one of them was was referred to as Sonic. You could be lying. I wouldn't even know. Saturn, which is S A T A N, the Saturday morning cartoon. That was like a, a much deeper one. That one was a the one you're talking about. It was like Goofy and the corn dog okay. or the chili dogs was yeah. a. That was like a, a you know 4 p.m. on Fox show. Okay, all right. Where that's more kitty based. Whereas so the one, Saturday morning was, was like a true drama. Yeah, I mean it was like I mean <laughs> as deep and dark as Doctor uh, Robotnik as dies Kiss at the end. Morning yeah. shows get, but it, it was like it was it, a precursor so, of like the the serialized HBO style television <laughs> that we have become used to. Well, the story of Sonic, even in the games, is that these like robotic dudes come and take over the animals yeah. and like all, and enslave kinda, them exactly. Yeah, and it's kind of true. The cartoon is more that flavored, where okay. it, it's, a, it's a little darker and it's about machines taking over and all okay. that. And there's this whole cast of characters in that show that, like, there's, like, a princess and a, and a bunch of stuff um, that, that are definitely not in the Sonic games. But it's cool, and it had, it had a nice feel to it. And this reminds me of that. Like, mm. that show is part of the reason why I like Sonic so much. And um, the, the plot of this game is stupid as fuck, but in a good way. It's very 90s, and it's not just a throwback to the yeah, games. Yeah. I like that it's a throwback kind of to everything. And the planet in that show was called Planet Freedom. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, <laughs> you had a very, very, very good answer. Yeah, yeah. that was a long walk you brought us yeah, on. Yeah, but yeah, you did it. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, again, it's it's that's why I think the it's titled that. But I do want to bring mention <laughs> to the fact that I think that the, the show was an inspiration for this game because you yeah. see it, you see it. It's not just like a shovel knight was to the games, but this is I think it's like the the Sega what I think of Sega being in the nineties, and um, I, I really like it a lot. Um, definitely recommend it. Okay, and the other thing is amplitude. My God. Like I'm trying to platinum that game. I want to now. At yeah. this point, it's like a, a desire I have. See, even games I've that never are platinum the game. I want you to know I'm not on this team, team trophy craziness. But I want to make it happen with well, amplitude. Well, there, there are some games where it's like I assume amplitude is really challenging to platinum because you have yep. to like be good as hell at it. I imagine. So like I can see how if you're really into it, you just want to be able to like. And that's my thing. Bar. Is like, it's yeah. it's so good. And uh, the speaking of bars, the the. The okay. way that they kind of Waiting score you is on bars. Okay, nice, nice, <laughs> So it's nice, like you nice, can three nice. bar the songs, and I've three barred every song in the game. So I'm on my way. Very I'm nice. getting there. Very I'm making nice. some damn progress Good. here. Um, but I still haven't like unlocked three, 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 three is the most. max. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so right. I've, I've maxed out all of them. Um, so I'm making some progress. The problem is there's a super difficulty to unlock, and I still haven't unlocked it because you have to beat the entire campaign on expert without dying. Mm, I'm like, or, wow. with, or with unlocking all the songs. And it is impossibly hard man yeah. like i feel like it should have been a little easier to do that um but my boy jimmy champagne hit me up on twitter and he he did his video that he, he posted and i i watched it last night and i was so busy last night and so tired but it was one of those things i haven't played the game for like a week mm, Jones we've been and doing stuff and i saw this video i'm like i need to stop what i'm doing i need to to, to play more of this jimmy champagne yeah. jimmy yes. champagne it's worth pointing out that we're in that time warp so i will have all the trophies and gone home 
on PlayStation 4, except are they out yet? doesn't exist. Are they out yet, the trophies? No, I haven't seen them. Have you seen them? Hey, what are the trophies? Yeah, Tell I, me all the trophies I designed for your them. game. <laughs> 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 why, why aren't they up yet? Where are my code? Why don't you have a code yet? This game, just give me the What's going on with the game? It's out right now. Making games is hard, man. Go buy it on PS4 <laughs> and Xbox One. Busting balls today, Greg. Yeah. Ball busting. Oh, well, it's because me and Steve are such good friends. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, yeah, I really recommend that. Amplitude. Steve's so please, please go support with the friends like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, go support Amplitude so I can get DLC. I'd appreciate that. And Freedom Planet because you got to go fast. And Freedom Planet too. Yeah, you does. do got to go fast. <laughs> and gone home. And gone home too. And if you Fine. want a palate <laughs> cleanser, <laughs> if you want a palate cleanser, download a, you know Mario Three or Super Mario World so you can see. Yeah, what, so what you can know what a real good game is. Exactly. I'm with you on that. All right, guys. Topic two. Topic two. Virtual reality. The future. Specifically, discussing the price of VR. Mm, Five hundred ninety-nine US dollars. The Neil Gaff thread that is entitled "All VR is Dead on Arrival." Yeah, yeah. which I don't agree with. Uh, so Steve and I had a little bit of a conversation over at lunch today, although we kind of cut it short because I don't, you know, as Greg always says, save it for the show. Yeah. Um, you don't want to burn cast. No, no, no. no. My, my my theory on this is, and it's been the same, and we've talked about this, you know, ad nauseum on PS I Love You and and on Colin and Greg is. And even on podcast beyond, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. Is that we've just been talking we, about VR? We for know VR years. is forever. <laughs> Makes you want to throw Kevin out a window. We've talked about VR so much. Uh, the nineties are back, yo. VR, the promise of VR is real. I gr- I believe it, and um, okay. you know, I'm not an, I'm not in the I'm not in the gimmicks. I think yeah. I, you know. I was a huge Nintendo gamer most of my life until Wii because I, and even as Greg often tells when or in the beginning of our co- uh, relationship in 2007, 2008, I was like such a Wii apologist, like it wasn't even funny. Eventually you just realize that Waggle, for instance, and motion control is probably not the way you want to play games. Um, I honestly feel that um, touch-based games have a place, but they're limited and you're not going to be able to, that's not the revolution that we need either because it, it, you can't really effectively play a shooter or a platformer. There are some clever digital controls, but they're not, it's not tactile, right? When I played VR for the first time, uh, Eve Valkyrie, uh, years ago, I was like, this is not astonishingly fucking good. Um, and I don't know if the burn is going to be slow or really slow. I don't think it's going to be anything more than slow, but I do think that we w- VR is going to stick and it will be around. Um, I don't think it's going to replace the way we play games now. As I've said, for for decades to come, we will play with a controller in our hands looking at a TV. I don't think that's going to change our computer screen or whatever, a laptop, whatever it's going to be, or a phone or a tablet. Um, but I do think VR, the promise of VR is real, and I think that... Um, <laughs> and I think that... I'm seeing haterism. On oh no! Face. Sorry, no. sorry, sorry. No. Nick just walked by and gave me. He started the, dancing in the, the doorway. Sexy Nick. Why look. do you hate good okay. shows, Nick? Why are you ruining my cadence, Nick? Why did Kevin just? You're not even on the show and you're interrupting <laughs> me. I don't know. I'll go check. Do you know? I don't care. I don't know why the door would be shut or open. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks, Nick. Good job. Uh, so, so, so. Anyway, the 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 point I was trying to make was that it's, virtual reality it's, is good. This is what I, yeah. Is that for, <laughs> I, I, think, I don't think I think there's going to be a lot of forced nonsense with virtual reality. Yeah. You have to look at it in the term of in terms of PlayStation Move or something like that, where like there's some things that prove that PlayStation Move could work, but it ended up being a gimmick. I always talk about sports champions as being a far superior Wii Sports. Um, but it was it was old and 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 wrought at that point. Like no, that's not what people want to do. Like sports champions was actually really impressive, especially the second one. Um, in terms moves. of the way it felt, you know, using you know both of them to you know shoot arrows and stuff like that, it was just way more immersive. Uh, but it was too late. I think sorcery um, and uh, medieval, medieval moves. moves are the two examples of games that were actually really fucking good on PlayStation Move. But but for all of those games, there was a lot of garbage and it died. I think with VR, there's going to be games that are not going to be good and games that are going to be good, but it's the practical utility of VR beyond games that I think is going to get these things into people's homes, and games to me are just the beginning, as we've talked about in the past. Um, so when I saw Oculus's price, uh, I wasn't super surprised because Palmer Lucky was being super cagey even with the pre-order announcements, and, it, and that, that telegraphed everything you need to know that that was not going to be cheap. Um, but then the, 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 as, as, an, as an audience member told us in a, in a very succinct way, as we talked about on Colin and Greg Live this morning, um, we pay, we would walk in, we wouldn't blush at spending $2,000 on a brand new, beautiful curved TV, right? Like one of those really new, beautiful, you know, LEDs or something like that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't think twice about that. You might, you could buy a $500 TV if you want, yeah. but if you want high end tech, you're going to pay for it. And so is it really that surprising that a fucking virtual reality headset that you're going to put on your head and has two OLEDs in it, even though I don't think that's the, that's the reason it costs so much and all these kinds of things. Is it surprising you pay $600 for it? No, not really. I think so. I think that our expectations 
certainly on PS I Love You with PSVR, we might we might just have been wrong about what we expected these things to cost. I guess I'll, I mean the only thing I'd say about that is that in Oculus's case, it's five hundred ninety nine US dollars on top of the cost of a really powerful PC. Sure, and we're talking really powerful PC. It was one of those things where I, I was on the side of like, come on guys, like it really can't be that bad. And cause I'm just assuming that even a normal PC can use it. Our laptops, which are ridiculously state of the art last year, granted. Yeah. Um, I would imagine would be able to run it. No problem. They have this like uh compatibility thing that you can run. And I ran, there was two out of five things that it was like, this PC can't do it. Granted it's a laptop. My desktop at home might be able to, but I was definitely surprised that, our laptops wouldn't be able to use yeah. it. That's the problem with it. And that's, I think that speaks to what they're going for, though. You know what I mean? I think that's been Oculus's deal from the get-go, is that I think it's been appealing to... The same way the PlayStation VR headset appeals to hardcore PlayStation fans, I think Oculus appeals to hardcore PC fans. I think it, I mean, it's very much an early adopter thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think that it's not really surprising that it's pretty darn expensive for the first time it's ever available. I don't think, I don't think they're trying to say... This is going to be something that millions of people exactly. are going to buy yeah. right now. Yeah, and it's just not targeted. Like I think they're consciously not targeted. That they're like, if you're super invested in having this experience, you can get it now. Yeah. If you want to not be the first, you know, to jump in the deep end, a couple of years from now, it'll probably be a couple hundred bucks less. Yeah, you know? exactly. And I, I think they're conscious of that. They just want to get it out there mm. before they can sell it for three hundred bucks. Yeah. And over bucks. on the over on the AMA, he was saying that. You know, they didn't want to do it cheap so everyone can get it. They want to do it right. And it's like, it's going to cost more, but at least it's the experience that they want to want to give. And I think that is a good thing in terms of talking about the TVs and stuff and the pricing on all that. It's like, you're right. Like those things, we would spend that much money. And with any tech, like you do got to spend money, whether it's an iPad or a phone or this or that. The difference is like you're, you'd spend $2,000 on TV. This isn't a TV. Like $600, even to me as somebody that splurges on tech, like I want tech everywhere everywhere <laughs> like i'm the type of motherfucker yeah i'm the type of motherfucker that's like oh there's an ipad pro do i want it you know like i questioned apple fucking watch all this shit and it's not just apple products it seems like that now but it's not mm-hmm. um but but with the with this vr stuff it's like i i'm interested in it but 600 dollars, like, oh shit that that's a lot it is you i know? mean but, but the thing is is that i, I think <sighs> see here's the thing uh, to the tv example like you buy a tv that could you can watch Anything on Netflix on it, mm-hmm. anything on Amazon on it, you can plug your Xbox, your PlayStation into it. You can plug your DVD player, you know, Blu-ray player into it, whatever, right? Um, so that investment gives you access to anything you might want to watch or play on it, right? And the thing that I feel like no one's been able to answer when I've asked about it is like, I understand that VR as a abstract experience is like cool and inspiring, but like, is there actually a killer app for it? What is the killer... Why do I need, what do I want to do with this thing? Yeah. And people are like, Elite Dangerous is really cool. E Valkyrie is really cool. It's like, is it a massively overpowered PC plus a headset so that I can have like the one experience of sitting in a couple of spaceship cockpits? Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, I feel like what they did is like years ago, they started putting the, the dev kits out. And I think what they wanted was to give people a lot of lead time to be like, by the time this goes commercial, I'm not asking that question. I'm like, Oh, there's all these games that only people who had Oculus headsets have been able to play. And God, I got to get to them. Oh, it's finally commercially available. Now I can do it. And I feel like even though it's the early adopter, first pass, more expensive than most people are going to want, I still think it's kind of a bad sign that I'm like, if I spent that money, what would I even be doing with Mm -hmm. it? Why aren't there... Why isn't there stuff ready for me to like use on on this thing? Yeah, I mean, it's funny you said killer app, and I think it's like even <clears throat> less than that. Where it's just it's not the killer app; it's more what are all the apps? Like it should be all of the things, right? And right, and it's weird that we haven't heard too much about that. And so earlier we were talking at lunch about the VR and it being two D. Like you were saying that VR needs to be three D. I never really thought about that because we always talk about the just I just it's a good way to just shut off and be able to play a game. Would we even be able to play just a two D just a game, but not even using the VR capabilities of it, but just looking at a 2D screen? It, it would have to... It's the way that they're planning on doing, like, Xbox One streaming to Oculus, where it's basically like there's a virtual screen that's in front of you. So, But it, it still is in a 3D space? Yes. Mm. So so they have to put a 3D that plane sucks. in front of you that you can, like, look around or whatever. It can't... There is no concept of just, like... A screen a in front s- of you? Like, you know how when, Man, you play, when you play a video game, when you play an FPS, and it's got the reticle and the ammo counter and all that stuff that's on the HUD? You just can't have that. Like, because there is no concept of, like, that. Where that should be in the space. Yeah, it has mm-hmm. to be in 
it can they can be 2D elements, but they have to be in 3D space. So it has to be like in the depth of the world compared to and like in an FPS, for instance, you need to like have a body so that you can reference yourself to. There's just a lot of ways that you can't just say take game X and throw it in VR. It really has to be designed for it. Mm. I think that's what I think that's kind of what the <clears throat> like like Wii Remote analog is. You know, like the things that made the Wii Remote worth having were like Wii Sports. Like games that were like this game is designed around this, you know, um, you didn't want to really play Zelda with Waggle. You wanted to like play a game that was about using that thing. And I think that's what VR has to be. And yeah, I'm not convinced that what VR is actually like inherently good for that. Nothing else can do is like broad enough that there's going to be enough to it that you're like, Oh yeah, I got to keep having more and more and more and more experiences on this headset. So I got to have one. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I, I think I feel like that's the Guitar Hero Rock Band curse, you know? You're like everybody has Guitar Hero Rock Band peripherals even either in their closet or at their garage sale at the dump. or at, at Goodwill. <laughs> um because you bought it 8 years ago, you played a bunch of Guitar Hero, you played a bunch of Rock Band, you played Rock Band 4, you played Rock Band Beatles, you played and you're sort of like all right, I think I've done everything I can do with these pieces of plastic, mm-hmm. and I fear that mm-hmm. VR is that on a like consumer mass entertainment level. I think VR is a lot more uh, has a lot more potential for like practical uses, like training doctors and doing like flight training for pilots, and like I don't know, like I mean, it's not like this is my favorite use of it, but like probably like controlling a drone that you're flying over Afghanistan or something, right? So- um, and also there's the whole thing that like when they announced that Facebook bought Oculus, the like the first thing that Zuckerberg said, it was like, it's like your lakes, I mean, courtside at a Lakers game. And I'm like, yeah, you sit in a seat, you put on the headset. If you can be watching like a live event and be able to actually like follow it, like you're actually there, that seems like something that is cool, but that seems like something that's more like for public exhibition. Like you mm-hmm. go somewhere and have that experience. You don't necessarily want to be like, I'm, I'm going to gear myself tonight. up yeah, yeah. so I can sit on my couch and put on a headset and, and watch basketball tonight, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the long-term like broad appeal of it. Just the potential for like how we're picturing it being like a consumer entertainment, like in-home device. But I'm not saying that's like, I don't know that that's my perspective on it. Yeah. I, I don't know if I see the version of like, Oh yeah, everybody's got VR in their house. Mm-hmm. Every like 20 years from now, it's like how everybody has a TV, you know? I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. For me, I think that uh, I, I agree with you and I agree with Colin too about it being a slow. Like, I don't think it's going to be a failure, but I do think that it, it, it's going to be slow. But every experience I've had with it has been amazing. Like a lot of them, you know, it's not they're not perfect. But every single time I am asking, what else can I do? And there has been answers so far. You but know, they, we but do are they one just demo. cool novelties yep. the one time you play and that's, them? And that's the thing is yeah. so far they are just cool novelties. But and here's I've said this before, but my big problem with it is I remember when the Wii came out and I was like, Oh man, Wii Sports is so cool because it's it gets my gears turning of what do I want to play with this? And it's like, I want a lightsaber game. I want, you know, uh I wanted Zelda. We right? all said we uh, wanted but, Zelda. But a Zelda and design. Then they came with Zelda. But but not really though, know. you know. And like that's the thing, is they kind of like were like, oh, this isn't Zelda made for this. It's Zelda, this is in it. Yeah. Right. And I I always wanted those things and never got them. And I think I'm in that stage now with this VR. It's like, you know, we play the that horror demo that we, the kitchen. Yep. And I was like, this is incredible. I can only imagine what a real horror game would be, not just this little slice. Or then we, uh, at a PSX, I played the Until Dawn uh, Rush of Blood. Rush of Blood, yeah. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is so much fun. But it reminds me, it's fun in the same way mobile games are fun, where it's just like, oh, this is cool. It's a cool little distraction. I don't really need a full game. It's like, it's a light gun game. Right. How fun are light gun games? They're a ton of fun. Once. Yeah. You know? So, and nobody makes them anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Colin. No, <laughs> you, I, you look just, like you're like. No, no. I'm, I, I'm just. I'm, <laughs> I'm just listening. It's sho- It's it's a little shocking though because I feel like your games are what VR is is made for. Like, I, that's that's the that's the incredible thing to me is like Gone Home in PSVR or Oculus is exactly what I want. See, I don't. The thing is, I don't. Think you, it's like, your game though, so you I would mean, know better I, than me. I, I just. I feel like so. There, there, there's just this thing where it's like, I think that there's such a disconnect between controlling your head and controlling your body 
when you have a VR headset on that like it really simulates you sitting in place and looking around. And I think there's tons of amazing experiences that can be about sitting in place and looking around and interacting with what you can see when you look around or like, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, but I mean, just having played games that attempt it, like it's so disorienting and, um, just like suboptimal to be trying to drive your body and look around and remember which way your body's facing, which way your head's facing. It's like mm. the, the, I, so here's what I'd say. Um, I think that we as people have like millennia of experience of like projecting our attention and consciousness into a frame, right? Your paintings in frames, television, video games, right? Like, I think that we are actually really good at being like, I'm sitting here, but I'm thinking about being there. You know what I mean? And I don't think that VR is enough of a step past that, that it makes such a difference that it's like worth all the limitations that it puts on those experiences that we already have. You know what I mean? It's just sort of like, I, I feel like it does seem like it would be really cool to just be in the gone home house and be able to walk around and look around and it feels like you're really there. But I think that what you actually start thinking about, you actually start thinking about how you're not really there. You're like, I'm looking around, but I can't walk around. I'm looking around with my head. This is so real. Wait, but I have to move my feet around with sticks or WSD or like, I don't know, however those handy controllers work or, or whatever. And like, I think that we have a, a set of games, you know, like first person shooters, third person action games, et cetera, that like they've been designed for decades of like screen and controls and and being geared towards that and i think that until we get to the point where there's some ver you know there's some more like holodecky kind of version of like you can look around by looking around with your head and you can walk around by walking around with your body but you're just seeing another place while you're doing it i think that disconnect is just too strong to really just let you navigate a space I feel like, like that. that's this uh, this is because that's what I when I played rigs at uh, PSX right and I put on the headset and I'm looking around with the headset and I think that's how and then you shoot that way right but then to move yeah you were using the sticks and it wasn't moving where I was looking it had to move where I was going right totally disorienting for the first round and then the second when we came back from halftime I had a little bit more of it and so my my counter to it is I really feel like it's just we have to learn. It's Maybe, the same yeah. way when we move from D-pad to analog or even now when you hand somebody who doesn't play games a thing, right? right? And they're like, yeah, let me play. And they're looking. Yeah. Oh, this, oh, yeah, yeah. Running or, into everything. Or getting, getting into like mouse keyboard when yeah. you first start oh, trying yeah. to well, play that, No, that's just, that just doesn't make sense, period. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Why yeah, no, and, 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 and you're right. <laughs> You're, you're totally right. And so maybe maybe that is more of it. Maybe it just has to become a convention and it has to be refined and yeah. it has to become more intuitive than it is now and it is totally viable. Yeah, I mean that, I that, I, yeah, I mean that was that was what I was thinking is what Greg was saying was that I don't even remember learning dual analog sticks, but at some point we had to. Oh yeah. And we were really introduced to like single analog sticks and C sticks and all those kinds of things, although right. dual analog sticks were coming out on PS one and um No, I totally and PS2. remember learning FPS controls on Halo One yep. and just being Halo. like the Halo and fuck Time Splitters. Is this? Like Yeah, absolutely. It's, so I, it's jacked up for a while. So I think to me in, in my because I agree with you that I think it's it's the, the the experience works best in sedentary kind of ways. Like if you're in E Valkyrie and you're in a cockpit, well, you don't have to worry about moving yourself. So so right. so you're, we have to worry about the the locomotion and propulsion of the ship. You don't have to worry about moving your own body, and I think that that's really vital. But um, yeah, touch him. Uh, touch but, my uh, <laughs> but uh, oh, God, to man. me, it's like to me, it's we have to unlearn. And this is this is what's going to be di difficult for gamers that have been brought up for almost twenty years now with dual analog sticks. Is we have to unlearn using the right stick. Right. The right stick right. is now your head, yeah. and the left stick is the way you get around. And if you can just, it's not going to be easy, and it's going to be really actually impossibly hard maybe for some people maybe maybe even us but i think that it's it's one of those situations where i'm i'm more concerned about the ceiling of ideas that come out of really creative people's minds to utilize it best in terms of video games because i agree with you that the practical applications i was just reading something about uh carson palmer uh, quarterback of the the cardinals was talking about how he's excited about the idea of training with a virtual headset like mm -hmm. virtual reality headset and like what does that mean for nfl teams so the all of these non gaming effects are virtual tourism or or wouldn't have been cool when New Horizons was going to Pluto and Sharon that like you could have there could have been a 360 yeah. degree camera on that that you could have yeah, just yeah, yeah. been there and looked around and just seen it you know absolutely so those pra those those things are obvious it, it, but I do agree with you that maybe the gaming application is most obvious to us yet hardest the hardest problem to overcome 
But I still think it's going to be it's it's contingent on it's contingent on people coming up with ways to make us believe. Yeah. And I think that um, I'm not even remotely clever enough to come up with anything that doesn't already exist. But I do think that maybe in 50 years when we have these things and they're way more complicated and we do have a locomotion so- solution and walk around all these kinds of things, maybe that is the realization of what we want we, what we want with VR. VR has been around for a long time. Yeah. It's not like a new technology. I mean, the promise of VR has been talked about since really the 80s. In terms well, and, of, it, and, and it has been a lot of technology advancement that has like made it more viable for sure. Like just the hardware and software in the 80s and 90s couldn't keep up right. with what you needed for this and we're still getting there where you still need really powerful hardware for it to be viable but it's like you know just eons past where mm-hmm. we were yeah 20, even 3d 20, 30 years ago yeah you know think of sure. 3d of like the red and blue and now where it's at and now where it will be yeah like it's crazy even like the, the 3ds i remember when that first happened i'm like you're telling me that i can see something 3d without glasses on yeah like that blew my mind yeah and it still kind of does when you look at it yeah. now. You're just like, really? <laughs> it it's, works. Yeah, and you hardly ever see that. Uh, it's really cool. What is? I'm curious about the, in your own studio though. It, are there people that disagree with you in terms of VR? Like when when it, you must have gotten an Oculus or P, well, maybe not PSVR, but an Oculus thing to fuck around with. Yeah. At some point, point we did, one, yeah. did were there some people right that the you worked? Were there some people that you worked with that were like, we? You sit in. A, I don't know how you guys make decisions there. Right. I mean, it's it's your studio, but but is, were there some people like we should maybe try? And and then there's some people that agree with you where it's like it, it's it maybe not going to work for our games. Uh, we don't really have any boosters at the studio for VR. We're all sort of cool with just like let's just make the game. <laughs> let's just make the game in in the the form that we. Because the thing is, here's the thing: you have to do a lot of really specific things to have even a like quasi acceptable version of this kind of game on VR. So like. You can't half ass you can't patch it in later. You know, you have to like there's no way to to you have to be very invested to do it at all. I think we're all sort of like we want to do the thing that, you know, goes on your screen and you use a controller and it's it's cool. There I, I think that you have to have somebody that is passionate about it and is obsessed with it and is like we have to have this experience, you know. Um and so that's I think I think it's, it's just on our our priority do internally. You, do you find that uh, amongst like your your peers at other studios or you know other indies, but also other maybe other like, do you find that that's the consensus, or do you find that do you know anyone that you're close to or that you're friends with that that wants that believes, or do you yeah, find no, that the consensus no, is there's, there's some I mean there's people that I like that I know in the industry that I follow on Twitter who are like making you know VR games and are 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 big into it. It's just like you have to go all, you have to go all in on it. Yeah, there's like a ton of learning. You you it has to be like your mission statement and so i think on that level on like a development level that just means there's a high barrier to entry because you're like okay we're not making a 2d platformer we're not making something that we know how to make we're not making something that has an install base of tens of millions of people we're making something that is like for this very small group of people that have this hardware that it's all about that like you know like um games like uh um um keep talking or yeah, and nobody explodes. yeah um you know it's like awesome you know like that's that is like a genius version of like you're sitting you're looking mm-hmm. you're you're interacting with this thing they also shipped a non-vr version of it <laughs> afterwards right and that's the thing you if you're going to make it a vr thing it has to start from vr and you can like strip the vr back out of it but you can't go the other way mm-hmm. you know what i mean so um i think like even just on a practical level just like people that are kind of outside of oculus as a company there's a lot to you're cutting off a lot sure if you if you go all in on that because you're not making something that just somebody can pick up a gamepad and play and so you just have to be like that's the investment we're making Mm -hmm. we are passionate we're obsessed with making a vr experience so i i think that's i think that's part of why we haven't seen the critical mass of like oh there's all these awesome vr games i'm just waiting for that commercial headset to come out so i can play them you know um what do you think about the stigma of just having something attached to you I feel like there's almost no consumer entertainment of any kind that breaks through where you have to have some shit strapped onto you. Sure. Headset, yeah. like headset, glove. Nobody wanted to use the the Wii wrist strap. The wrist strap was too much. The controller was fine because you just drop it. The wrist mm-hmm. strap is no good. When they pegged it right through a TV. Huh. I mean, that's when people start. So sure. Ke- Kevin makes a point. People yeah. wear headphones. People wear earbuds. I mean, the big thing about it is I don't think, th- I think, again, we're talking about two different things, right? I think we're talking about 
this subset hardcore gamer audience that's into it and wants to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't. Yeah, mainst- yeah, yeah. I mean, mainstream wrist straps. That you know, that's what the Wii was going for. And granted, I didn't wear my wrist strap either. But I mean, like, it wasn't amplifying my experience, right? right I right. think even if you're like look stupid and you put it on that first time and you play that game or that experience that clicks for you, right? I think that'll be the thing where it's like it's gonna, it's going to continue to be. It's like a virus. Yeah. Somebody you have to get you get touched by it, you get infected, you understand, and then yeah. somebody else you keep going. There's like a that. weird fear to VR too. Like I don't yeah. really know how to put this in words, but like when you you it's kind of scary, even not playing a scary game, even playing like some stupid like you know, the just, like a colorful, like bright game, you put that on, you you're still aware that you're in a room. Yeah, you're cut off you know? from the, the outside world. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's kind of like when you if you can't hear what's outside you and you can't see what's outside you. I've had multiple times it with uh with PSVR on where I was just like Oh, there's people around me. Nick's around me right now. Right, right, That's right. scary to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, seriously though, and it's just like there's very even if you're home alone, that's kind of scary too. Sure, you know. Yeah. And like, I, I've thought about that. The first person whose house is going to catch fire while he's in a VR things, head. Things like, like what that. The fu-? You know, not hear the smoke alarm. I know. Granted, if you're locked in, if you yeah, have your room closed, you like have head- your headphones. Exactly, exactly. exactly. You headphones, no, no, no. This isn't. Games. Yeah, yeah. But it is a little bit different. Where I've had multiple times where I felt this really weird, yeah. intense fear. You can't just look over your shoulder. Yeah, you have to look over your shoulder and take the helmet. Yeah, off. yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a legit thing. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things to get through and learn with with this mm-hmm. you know what i mean like it's not it is a completely new experience that's why it's exciting i think i i mean i believe in it far more than i've believed in move or any of that stuff because i kept early on i kept saying it's going to be another move it's going to be another move it's going to be another move where it comes out and it's cool and the launch lineup sucks and then no it doesn't sell and so then nobody else makes games for it and so then they everything gets abandoned i mean the thing work. is i fear that it kind of is that you that's, that's i know that's still the fear but I, I mean no i mean but like i fear that i fear that may you feel this in your soul right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because, like, I mean, it just, it feels Wii remote to me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, the Wii remote came out. Everybody was like, holy shit, we're all going to buy a Wii. Everybody had a Wii. And then the lightsaber game never came. PlayStation got in on the PlayStation Move. Xbox got in the Connect. Both Xbox nope. and Sony super late, though. No. Nope. Yeah, but they I mean. There with the, like, but, the- but Oculus is out now. PSVR is still, like, in June. early stages. Of, no. They say June, buddy. I mean, okay. Sure. I meant to say yes, definitely. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, it's not yet, right? So we don't know if it... But, no, I know. But I know. All, all I mean is it feels to me like there's a big bubble around, like, the promise of VR via Oculus. And I think the Vive and mm. PSVR and, it's in, like, Google Cardboard, I don't yeah. know, are all trying to, like, get in on that. And I have not seen the proof in the pudding that it won't be we remotes 10 years five five years from now mm-hmm. 10 years from now. i could well just a shit ton of them next to the guitars i don't know i don't know no it's gonna be interesting that's why i can't wait to see what happens this yeah. year how it all nets out no yeah. it's we remotes all the way down <laughs> <laughs> all right guys topic three i want to talk about tacoma now here's the thing mm. this is a new segment of this show when we have mm. gentlemen like yourself on that, that create these games or ladies or ladies you're correct what i mean nicole tan answer my calls yeah. come on I want you to pitch us on why Tacoma is going to be awesome. It is going to be the killer app for VR. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was waiting for the whole time. You know what I have discovered? The killer app for VR. Tacoma. <laughs> uh, we're not doing a VR version. Um, uh, so Tacoma takes place on a space station um, from the creators of Gone Home. Colin sold. Yeah. You got yeah. Gone Home. You got space. Yeah. yeah. He's gone in. Home in space. I mean, I'm done, right? Mm-hmm. There we go. Yes. <laughs> no, Next um, the, I, I guess um, here's the truth. I haven't worked on the, the elevator pitch very much. I don't, I don't have the like part one, In part two, part three. Yeah, Nailed yeah, yeah. it. Um, I think that on some level that's because we are still really internalizing what the heart of that experience is. But I'll try now. So Tacoma is a you know non-combat first person story exploration game. It takes place on a space station 60 years from now, um, 65, 70 years from now. Um, and I, cause I still think of it in, in terms of Gone Home, right? So a game like Gone Home is all about environmental storytelling. It's you and the environment. It's you and a house, right? Like Firewatch is you and a forest. Um, you know, everybody loves Everybody's gone to the rapture. It's like you and this village, right? Um, and in some cases, there's characters that 
you can hear from or that you can see, you know, what they've done or, you know, environmental storytelling is all about inferring what has happened to these characters in the past. Right. Um, with Tacoma, one advantage we have is that we're setting the game in a fiction where there is this digital technology that is surrounding the characters. They're on this space station Tacoma. And speaking of VR, um, AR, augmented reality is like a part of their everyday life. And so a big part of the experience, if Gone Home was just all about finding the evidence of what happened to people and putting the pieces back together, on Tacoma, the crew was having their experience recorded by the station constantly. And so you go into the space, and as you're exploring, you're not finding just the messages, the notes, the artifacts they left behind, but you also see these recreations kind of like holographic recreations in your augmented reality rig of what actually happened to them at different points over the course of their posting on the station and it's not just okay you can stand there and watch them do something but because it's being placed in space in your your you know fictional augmented reality rig you occupy the space with them you can walk around the characters as they're interacting as they're having scenes as they're going through what happened before you got there and beyond that What's important to us is the each like wing of the station, each like major section of the station, each recording in that space is all of the characters that were there going about their business, going through their scenes. And so you as a player, you're not just finding them sitting there and watching, but characters might be having a conversation and somebody else comes in, starts talking, somebody else leaves. You are in control of saying okay uh i'm gonna uh, that person left i'm gonna go follow them and see what they're doing but i know these people back here were doing something while i was gone and you have control as a player over rewinding fast forwarding pausing controlling basically time and space as far as like your relation to the story because you can say like wait i saw this but i know those characters are over there i'm gonna move the timeline back to this point and then i'm gonna move myself in space over here and yeah, those two things are happening at the same time. So what does that mean? And basically, we're trying to push ourselves to make you involved in reconstructing this story in a different way that allows you to have that very intimate feeling of like sharing the space with the characters while these things are happening to them, while they're experiencing what you're just kind of seeing echoes of, but also to fully interactively be placing yourself within that whole kind of like structure of what happened to them and putting those pieces back together in like a traditional, you know, environmental storytelling kind of way, but with tools that we wouldn't have had in Gone Home that I haven't seen in other games like this. Um, so that's why I don't have a sexy elevator pitch. <laughs> that was because good. I have, a, great, I have yeah. a cool, it like, like, conceptual, you neat thing. Um, I would like to get that down to 20 seconds, but we'll see what we can <laughs> do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Augmented reality, gone home in space. Yeah. There you go, Don. And we are working with um, Microsoft on it. It's going to be first on Xbox One and PC. And um, it's cool because they were kind of like bringing out HoloLens around the same oh, time yeah. as we started talking to them. And we and they kind of separately we had together and we were like you know we can actually like do this in a hollow lens like you could put on a hollow lens and see a character in the room with you and be able to walk around them um i don't know if that's ever going to happen but mm. it's it's just cool to know that like this thing that we started doing just purely as like a far future like you know fictional thing it's like if we were able to you could actually do that <laughs> with this thing that we're like working on right now um so it's just it's it's neat to see that like it's speculative fiction, but it's not complete fantasy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Jumping off the Gone Home cast from last week. Yeah. I left all that out. So for this one, how soon after you finish Gone Home do you move on to this? And is this the first idea you guys were working with? You talked about how for Gone Home, right? It was that you wanted to do the narrative storytelling in the space. Mm -hmm. and the, Okay, let's do it in a house and do this. Was it like, let's do it again in space? Space space? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the game is called Tacoma because it was originally going to take place in Tacoma, Washington. Oh, okay. uh, and we went pretty far down that road for like the first few months of development. It was another like very grounded story of like people that lived in Tacoma, Washington at a different time than Gone Home took place. And it was about finding out about their lives. And we were working on it, getting it on screen. And I was like, 
this is way too familiar. We shouldn't be doing this again right now. <laughs> you know, like it, it took a little while to realize like, okay, this is closer than I thought it was going to be. I really don't think that not just because it felt like people would be like, oh, that's just the same, like, you know, player base, but because we expanded our team on this game, you know, we brought on new people and it started to feel really tangibly weird that we were making something that was very much like Gone Home and like part of the team had worked on Gone Home and part of the team hadn't. And there was this mm. feeling of like, oh, you're the guys that made Gone Home and we're doing that again and you know how to do it. We've never done it before. So, you know, it was like kind of an insider outsider kind of thing to it. And so I, I was, I've told this story before, but I was, um, my wife and I went to Crater Lake in Oregon for our anniversary um, oh. yeah and you can uh you can take a boat out to an island in the middle of crater lake which is called wizard island uh <laughs> and, and so we were hiking on wizard island uh which is pretty <laughs> much one the, does yeah <laughs> the best the best. wizard hat on wands <laughs> uh and and i was talking to her about it and i was like you know i think this thing we're making it, it's a it's a good idea but like it's getting too close to what we've already done. I don't think we can do that again and blah, blah, blah. And I think we, you know, we want to make the same kind of game, but set in like a different place where it could work. Like it would have to be like an Arctic base or like a, a band, you know, a derelict ship in the sea or like a space station. And she was like, Oh, space station sounds cool. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> done. Uh, and, and so we talked about it more and kicked around the ideas of like, what would be cool about that? And kind of by the end of that trip, I was ready to take it back to Carla at Fulbright and pitch her on it. And then like, you know, we kind of like got our heads around. Why is this interesting? Why is it worth doing this? Why wouldn't we do some other setting or like, what are the risks? You know, what's going to be hard about this bubble and, and got to the point where we're like, yeah, this does make sense. This is, this is something that is different enough to be worth doing. We brought it back to the team, pitched them on it. Just kind of went from there. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, we just wanted to get to the point where all of us on the team we're facing a bunch of big questions that none of us had answered before. Mm. And we all felt like we were in the same boat of like, none of us had made a game exactly sure. like this before, you know? Um, and the cool thing is it's, it's given us these additional kind of like interactive storytelling tools that we wouldn't have had otherwise if we had just stuck with what we thought we were going to do in the first place, you know? Yeah. We've got a couple questions from Twitter. Dude. K Paul the boss. Yes. Wants to know what are some pieces of storytelling that influenced Tacoma? Like film and literature, yeah. et cetera. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, some of the obvious ones are like the original Alien, right? Um, and uh, so the 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 game is about these six people that are stuck on this facility together. They're isolated. They're kind of like been shoved off on their own. And it's not the greatest um, assignment in the world. They all kind of like they didn't get there because they're like the cream of the crop as far as the company is concerned like something means this is why they got this posting and uh so the wire is like mm -hmm. an influence because mm -hmm. i'm like they're, they're kind of like they're kind of like mcnulty's you know crew that got shoved down to the basement like they all did something that means they're here for a reason but they're they're trying to do a good job and they have to rely on each other and um so that was that was sort of that's something that i've come back to um breakfast club that's about six people stuck in a room together <laughs> and they have to awesome. learn how to deal with each other um it, the interesting thing is that we've had to um really learn a new kind of storytelling for us like not the whole like rewind fast forward ar figure kind of stuff but our stories that we've done from minerva's den to gone home have always been like very focused there's been like a protagonist you know like in minerva's den it was cm porter he was the guy that founded this place. He had this whole thing. There were other characters, but it was like, and similarly, Gone Home, it was about the family, but it was really about Sam, right? Sam had a story and went through the game. There was one story that went through the game. And we kind of, when we started out, we kind of approached it, approached Tacoma that way because we didn't know any, any other way. And it has been a real learning experience to be like, how do you write something differently for it to be an ensemble story, for it to be about something that affects this whole group and and it's relevant to all of them and that you can see who they are through the lens of like this shared story instead of just like here's the main character we're following their story everybody else is kind of like secondary mm -hmm. so that's why we've been going going back to these pieces of media that are about like a group of people that all have to kind of be in it together and how do they get through that you know it's exciting i'm excited yeah. to play it 
Uh, one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, by the time people see this, I guess Gone Home is finally coming to console or whatever <laughs> after a long tortured kind of thing or whatever. But uh, yeah, Chris, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, was it important for you to kind of partner with one of the first parties in order to m kind of make sure this game gets to a wider audience, a console audience? Because people have been begging for Gone Home on console for a long time, and it took it took some time. So was that kind of a no brainer that you would kind of go with Microsoft or Sony or, or both? Um, yeah, I mean, Microsoft was just was the right partner for us because, like, we we thought it would be great to 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 have like strong like invested partner at one of the platforms right because like i don't know whatever i was on stage at e3 last year like that's not the kind of opportunity you get if you haven't kind of like thrown well unless you're making fallout or whatever, <laughs> right but like if, if you're an indie you kind of have to like be you know have have a deal with somebody mm -hmm. to, to sort of be like we're going to invest in you we're going to sure. be on your platform you're going to help us get the word out about our game in ways that we couldn't otherwise, right? And Microsoft is in the position where they're they're trying to they're they're working hard, right? Like to to get up yeah. in in the in the marketplace, right? Like Sony got a big head start and the folks at Microsoft, they're like, "Okay, we got to like really invest in making unique experiences be on Xbox to give people like a really strong reason. Like I've got to have, I got to have an Xbox. You know what I mean? Like this is on it. This is on it. They're doing this. It's got, you know, backwards compatibility, et cetera. Right. They're, they're trying to, to sort of say like, here's our arguments for you should like mm -hmm. not write off Xbox. It's got like all this great stuff on it. Right. And so when you are an indie that, that is, you know, trying to, to have as much, to have like as strong a partner as possible, the, platform that is working harder is gonna just is just gonna be more um invested in like making you successful right because sony has they're fine yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know we're, we're starting to see a lot of really interesting cool xbox one exclusives like oxen free yeah. which is xbox and pc um and you know like cuphead is coming out we're you know gonna be part of that and just being partnered with the group that's like we're gonna fight for you we're gonna work for this we're gonna do everything we can it's really important to us for you guys to be successful and be part of this like identity that we're that we're building for the platform to move it from where it is right now um it it's it's just a it's a good match you know what i mean if you're trying to kind of like have as much support as much visibility as yeah, possible totally. and then the folks at microsoft are just really cool they're just good like the team that we're working with really experienced really good Mm -hmm. really good people that like they helped us you know like make our e3 presentation our trailer like as good as it could be just with like great feedback they know how to make an impression you know what i mean so we've been we've been really happy so far uh just being able to to work with them and it's always i mean it ain't it ain't such a bad thing to only have to like target one console at a oh, time sure, be sure. able to get it done <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean um so that's an advantage too you know just on the development side of course yeah Look out for Nate Ahern over there, though. I don't trust him. Oh, Nate. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I, I just said that weirdly. It's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> Another cool question comes from Andrew Taylor. He says, what kind of challenges are there when making a game set in space? Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, honestly, because, like, um, I think a big part of it is that it's so unfamiliar. Like, that was, that was one of the advantages of Gone Home was it was so familiar. You were like, I, I can... Feel like I've been in this house before, maybe. You know, you're sort of like I this. I know what this place is like. I recognize this uh, on some level. And a space station is, in a lot of ways, totally alien. You know, it, it's it's not like a place that you've been before, really. Except maybe if you've like gone on a tour of a submarine or yeah. you know something you know, something like that. Or um, space camp. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that that's the challenge is sort of like us being like, okay. This is a totally unfamiliar environment to the player, to us, but also to the people in the fiction that live there. And so the cool thing is part of what that motivates us to do is be like, with that being true, with this being like an isolated space facility with all these technological requirements, how would these people make it feel more like home and feel more like a, a place that they don't feel like they're just in like a weird lab all the time? And how do we get that across to the player? Because that's going to make it feel more like a real place to the player at the same time. You know, yeah. there's also gravity and all that kind of stuff. That's <laughs> different. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
Cool. You guys have any other questions about the yeah, promo? Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious. I mean, I know devs hate these kind of questions when they're working on a, a specific game, but is this, is this what your studio is, uh, is this what you want your studio's identity to be in 10 or 20 years? Is this the kind of game you want to continue to make? Because you have a diverse interest in other games yeah. as, as many developers do that make, you know, maybe make one type of game, but you, you know, you play your shooters and all these kinds of things. Do you guys want to make like a something else at some point or, or is this, are you always going to have know. a story driven, like narrative driven kind yeah, of mentality? I don't, I don't really know, you know, like I don't even know really like what, I don't, I don't, I don't even know what the next step after this really looks like. You know what I mean? Um, I Going think home to, okay. Back to the green briars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's one of those things where I, I can't say the answer is yes. Because I just don't know what life after Tacoma really even consists of. You know, it's one of those things where we have to we have to get enough distance from it to even know what we want to do next. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because if you're like, okay, we finished Tacoma, we gotta make something else right now, it'll probably be pretty similar. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, if we're fortunate enough that the game can do well and then we can get some distance and be like, what does it really mean to keep making games past this? Um, I think that that's a really, you know, open question. Um I think that we probably I think there are some things that would probably be consistent. I know like I doubt we'll ever really make like a violent game. I doubt we'll probably ever make like a hardcore like skill based, you know, reflex twitch game or something like that. I would guess, probably not. I think that um the core people who are involved with what we're do with what we do were just like we're interested in smaller, maybe more like contemplative experiences on some level. I think there's a lot that you can do with figuring out how to focus in more and and go smaller and, and kind of say like, how can more relatable or or just how how can how can we give people experiences they haven't had before? Um, in a way that fits kind of what our what our what our aesthetic interests are, you know what I mean. But I don't think that necessarily means the only kind of game we ever make is a first person story exploration game. But I don't really know what else it's going to be. So <laughs> I guess we'll, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by. I mean, Gorilla is a great example. We, we've talked about them a lot. It's like mm-hmm. it's like FPS, 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 third person action RPG. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, where the fuck did that come yeah. from? Yeah, well, you know, like like like, and and that's great, and yeah. I'm excited about it. So I'm always interested in like, you well, know, I think you even look at stuff like you know Naughty, Naughty Dog, right? Like they they've done third person action games forever, but like Crash Bandicoot to Uncharted to Last of Us, it's it's the same basic form but such different you know aesthetic goals and kinds of mechanics and and things they're achieving without saying oh we're naughty dog we're going to do a turn-based space rts now you know um so so i think that there's this whole spectrum of like being able to do something you've never done before without necessarily saying and now it's time for a submarine sim right right. yeah (laughs) no understood yeah are you prepared to confirm or deny no, no. That Tacoma is in the Gone Home universe. Yeah, it is. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Well, we good? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was much easier than I thought it'd be. Before we move on to topic four, do you have any final questions about Tacoma? Uh, still shooting for this year? Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what is that? What is that? What is that? I'm that seriously wishing. Sincere. Good luck. Good luck. I, I know it's hard <laughs> making video games. That's the way I read it. Do you have any closing words about Tacoma? No, I mean, thanks. Thanks for uh, for giving me some time to talk. I mean, I, it's cool to get to start to be able to kind of go in depth with it. We're going to be showing more of it later this year. So How awesome will it be? Um, I'm going to give it 9 out of 10 platinum trophies. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> it. That's really awesome. <laughs> That's, That's great. The 10th one was Gone Homes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, Topic 4 is brought to you by the Kind of Funny Forums. Go! to kindoffunny.com slash gamescast topic to leave your topic for the show, just like all these beautiful kids did. All these questions. Big, beautiful kids. The big, beautiful kids. Big, beautiful kids. They're big? They're big. Okay. Yeah. We're good. Um, this is directed directly to you. All of these questions. The topic is? Okay. It's about, it's about okay, you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm, doggy wants to know, good. what do you have to say about your games not being called games by haters? <laughs> I re I, I replied to him with a haters gonna hate uh, JPEG. It was the one of the guy going like that over a puddle. Yeah. Um. So just picture that. Yeah. Good. No, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I 
we talked about this, I guess, on the oh, on the Gone on the, Homecast. On the Gone Homecast. YouTube. com slash kind of funny games and podcast services everywhere. <laughs> so I won't go. I won't go deep on it. You should. You should grab the Gone Homecast that we that we just did. But um, I don't know. I I feel like saying something isn't a game is one way of just saying it's like it's outside of what you would traditionally consider like a game, right? And I mean, obviously. A dishwasher isn't a game, right? But when you're playing like an interactive experience on your game console, um, hopefully it means that we're doing something to expand the territory of what people think of as like being a game you can play. Um, but if you want to hear like the deeper, dorkier version of like what makes it game like to me, I think we talked about that a little bit more. I, I don't I don't like I don't take it I don't like take it personally or whatever. I think it's just like it's just a way of saying this isn't for me. This isn't an experience that like I connects enjoy. with me, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the shorthand for that is this isn't even a game. And you know, like I'm not the kind of person who I would. I'm happy just saying I don't really like something <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to saying it's not a yeah. whatever. Um, but you know, it it there's a the cool thing about what's going on with games now is they they are just broadening constantly. There's just more kinds of games constantly. There's you know. Minecraft begat survival games, you know, like survival crafting games were not really a thing, you know, while and now we've got those. Now we've got, you know, like VR is going to make these games that we just didn't have before. So hopefully there's just like more cool experiences for everyone mm-hmm. as we keep going, you know. Our boy Maximum Cortez, he wants to know, how do you feel about your haircut? Oh. Oh, I mean, this is more of a question for the kind of funny crew. What do you guys think of my haircut? It's good. <laughs> okay. I like it. That's I fun. like it. I like the the old hair too, though. I okay. want to say so. That, that's why I want to know. I you know I've went through a lot of different types of haircuts in my yeah, life, sure. mm-hmm. and I felt differently about some of them. This this one I'm having right now. No, okay, not no, that. Okay, happy about. no. I what think Kevin verbalized. Oh, I like it. Okay, all right. Cause, Cause, well, because I got last haircut, not so much. Okay, that was what it was. All right. Because yeah. I'm talking about the long hair to the side yeah. one. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. because I, I saw it on my peripheral vision, just Kevin just going. I was like, what, <laughs> hater? Oh, you're making fun of Nick. Or, Kevin's or, or, a, is, is a, the epitome of massive distraction on this show. You always catch but, me in your peripheral vision. But, I've asked for a curtain for a long time. <laughs> Greg hasn't Dude. answered at all, and that makes me worried. I like the hair fine. I miss the glasses. Really? Yeah, I'm a big glasses fan. I mean, we do have two out of three glasses havers right here. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. I got LASIK. I got laser shot in my eyeballs. I can't wear glasses You're anymore. from the future. Did they do that on Wizard Island? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that would have been a magical spell, not a laser. Excelsior! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maximum Cortez also wants to know, what are your expectations for your games going forward? I guess. Yeah. Colin already kind of, kind yeah, of asked that. Colin's thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fabio Rappi wants to know, I would like to know his most anticipated games of 2016. Uh, Dishonored 2. Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, Firewatch yes. by my friends at Campo Santo. Um, XCOM 2 is sounding really awesome. Uh, that's a good four. That's, yeah, a, that'll, that'll that's solid. That's a good start. Solid. I can't wait for Firewatch. And We're I want to play closer. Oxenfree when it comes out in like a week. Or, well, I mean, whenever this airs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it might be out now. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to checking out Oxenfree when it hits. Confucius90 wants to know, do you know or have you seen Ken Levine's next game? Um, I don't think I really know anything more about it than everybody else does. I mean, he's talked about how it's like this sort of like replayable story experience that sort of talk about narrative Legos, et cetera. Um, but, uh, I haven't, I haven't gotten to seen it. I haven't gotten to seen it. I'm great at talk what? of, uh, <laughs> no, I, I haven't gotten to see it or anything. Um, I know that, yeah, they've been working on it for a while. They, I mean, they kind of went from the big team to small thing small team yeah. thing you know i think they're like tw- you were ahead of your time they're like 20 or fewer people at this point and i think they're you know like 2k is giving them the time to explore how to make something that they haven't haven't made before sure. basically um I, i'm i'm certainly interested to see what it what it ends up being mm-hmm. me too i'm sure this is an annoying question that greg probably already asked you in the i have touched i have touched ken's beard multiple times though, so what's the review on that uh, that's, How many platinum trophies? That's like, can it go up to eleven out of ten? Sure, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Fuck it. Is that where you got your powers of creativity by touching his? Well, as like la- last time, no, uh, last yours. time we met, uh, went in for the hug, and he said, ah, "I think we velcroed a little." <laughs> <laughs> you velcroed. Uh, so yeah, some sparks were thrown off. There might have been some transference. Oh, oh that's God. a good Ken impression. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I spent a lot of time around him. <laughs> Why is Gone Home not on Vita? No. Oh. 
I didn't ask that. Oh, you didn't? No. <laughs> Dude, at the this fuck, p- Greg. It's been two you and a half one job. years of me begging to get trophies <laughs> and gone home. It's on PS4. Good enough. Like the yeah. war is over. It was it, it was hard enough getting it to run on run well on consoles. I don't even know about be the product ab- yeah. about yeah. handhelds. But I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's it, it let's take it one step at a time. I'll we're do, we're doing yep. two consoles right now. We're taking it two steps at a time. Good. I, we'll go from there. I'll respond as Geo Corsi would. With remote play, every game's on Vita. And, that, and that's actually true. And I think I think probably being able to lie in bed with it on remote play be a good match. Yeah. Um, and speaking of all of this, yeah. Jeff Meyer 87 says, can you ask him about the challenges bringing Gone Home to consoles and how they got it done? I mean, uh, we part of, part of why it took longer was um, Unity 5 coming out made mm-hmm. things a lot more viable to get onto PS4 and Xbox One um, than Unity four point X. Um so you know the engine being upgraded helped just because compatibility with the new with the new consoles um was greatly improved. Performance was improved, features were added, et cetera. And then the other side of it is um when we when we kind of jump started the process back up, we brought the port in house and our programmer Leon had done the ports uh in in studio. So we've been able to like be there, you know, like making sure that it's it's what we standard. want it to be yeah. you know like every step of the way um so you know that and and there's the first time you as a studio not like somebody working at a triple a studio but as like an indie studio tries to get a game on a console you learn a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh there's there's you know just like just all of the testing certification approvals all that stuff you know you kind of like you 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 jump in and you're like okay we'll know how to do this next time uh, <laughs> so you know it's 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 been a big learning experience it's been um it's it's the challenges everybody has probably just trying to get their own game onto onto console there's a lot of stuff you got to get right you know mm-hmm. Emmett Watkins Jr. wants to know what do you think's the next twist on the teenage slash coming of age genre like Gone Home and Life is Strange. Oxen free coming to Xbox One and PC. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of questions I want to know about what's happening to these kids' lives. There's also teens in Firewatch. Yeah, but they're just drinking. Yeah, I mean, they're, on the fire well, they're, they're nude teens. Yeah, they are. <laughs> My favorite. Kevin's into it. But they're, but they're only in silhouette. They're very far away. You don't get to... It's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, um, I actually... I mean, I, I, I honestly am looking forward to seeing what Oxen free is doing with it. Because, like, they're, it's cool that we've gotten to a point in games where you can be like man there's sure a lot of games about just like teens being friends with each other and talking <laughs> it's like really <laughs> we've got too many of those because <laughs> you know like and and so it, it is really cool that more people are able to broach topics of just like oh we should do something about like this time in our lives mm. you know that mm-hmm. that's awesome to see so um but i you know and we're seeing like when when we we're doing the gone home cast um greg mentioned uh emily is away you know, uh, Nina Freeman, who works at Fulbright as a level designer, just a couple months ago released Sybil, which is a game about being a teenager online, playing an MMO, falling in love mm. with someone else that that you're playing this online game with. So I think there's all these perspectives into just like, what does it mean to kind of reexamine your youth through interactivity, through games, through different formats, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Real quick, I'm sorry. I should have done this because when I think it was Marty pitched me on Oxenfree a long time ago, the way he did it was Freaks and Geeks meets Lost, mm. and I left that part out. That's a that's a better. That's a good. That's a good that's summation. Good pitch. Marty, right. leave everybody. I don't know where he works. <laughs> <laughs> Fatty Man wants to know: In what ways can games like Gone Home be expanded on to add more interactivity for the player? I mean, I guess that was kind of what the Tacoma thing was about. Because I, mean, yeah. I think that I mean I think that something that's really important about Gone Home is that most of the most of the action happens in your head right like it's about giving the player the interactive tools to like fully explore everything they would want to explore about this environment but then like you're putting all those pieces together off screen Mm -hmm. um i think it's kind of important that it isn't about like changing the story by playing or the story being different every time you play because of randomization or whatever like the the value of it is just you being given this box of pieces and and the mental work of like organizing them into something that makes sense to you. Um, but I hope that something like Tacoma will add additional layers to that where you're like, not just I can kind of watch what these people did, but I'm arranging myself in 
the timeline of their experience and having another tool for picturing, oh, here's what this must have been like before I got here. Um, but I mean, I, I think there's something really cool about just kind of like giving someone a place and letting them just find out mm -hmm. what it's about. Like, you know, there's plenty of real life stories of just like, oh, there was this, you know, this house we found it just seemed like the family never came home one night and has been, you know, abandoned for 20 years. Just like being in there, just going through and just trying to find out who these people were, like that's amazing, yeah. you know? Um, so I think just giving players like the fidelity to really feel like they're able to be that person in that role and really have that amazing discovery, I think is, is powerful on its own, you know? Mm -hmm. These next two questions are kind of similar. We got a uh, little sausage party. Yeah, we do. Who wants to know? <laughs> You mean in this room right now? <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about creating games that are designed to make people weep like newborn children? And Ryan Parker wants to know, how does it feel now that you've made one of his favorite games of all time? Aw. Um, those aren't that similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, both in terms of how do you feel about these things. Um, I feel like uh, I love to lap up gamers' salty tears. <laughs> so making people cry is wonderful. No, I, I, I think that like... So to that to that question on the on on the real for real answer to that question, I think that if anything, I don't I think there's some people who are like, well, if you can make people cry, that means you made art. Yeah, if you made people cry, then that means it was like a real like a experience. I think there's a lot of ways to make people cry because you know how to make them cry, not because they actually felt something legitimate, you know. And I and so I think and hope that if people had that strong of an emotional reaction to gone home, it was because they felt like they really made a connection with these characters and what happened to them. And like, I think that I hope that it's, it's a good, I, I feel like a lot of people when they say I cried at the end of gone home, it was like out of like relief sure. that like this person that you had grown attached to and cared about is going to kind of be okay. You know, like a bittersweet way. And I would much rather be able to say that that's the like intense emotion someone had than like, we got you with like, you know, all of the, the kind of emotional, you Trips, know, like, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, so if we can, if we can make something that people had that reaction to because they like cared and believed in it, then, then I'm, I'm happy. Um, and to the second question, I would just say, feels good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does it ever weigh on you? I mean, like, cause we talked about it a little bit with like, you know, Minerva's Den comes out and everybody's like it's the best DLC of all time and then you go and you make Gone Home right and people it's giving nines and tens I guess we kind of see a little bit of that in the original you abandon the original Tacoma idea right is it constantly on your mind of like I don't want to let people down I don't want to disappoint people I think I think we just don't want to repeat ourselves because players won't be excited about what we're doing and we won't be excited about what we're doing to sure. get it done you know I think that that we try to listen to ourselves as best as we can and say like do we really feel like this is something that we've never done before and that we have to get out there because, and if that, if the answer is yes, then hopefully that means people will play it and be like, wow, okay, this was worth playing. Like I, I needed to play, I need to tell my friends they got to play this thing because there's nothing else like it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's more about not becoming complacent and not being like, oh, last time we did that, it was good. So let's just do it again. Gotcha. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. For the final question, I'm going to take things in a really weird direction. Mm. The Arctic Sloth wants to know, if you were a serial killer, what would be your calling card? <laughs> of course, Franklin Sizemore shows up and asks this. <laughs> um, I would drop a Greg Miller headshot on every dead body uh, so that Greg Miller would be arrested in my place and go to I prison forever. I don't they just arrest me on that. <laughs> they would. They're I mean, like, I, it must be this guy. I read the synopsis for this thing called Making a Murder, and it seems like the justice system and police force, they're pretty much on top of everything. It wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't be that easy. <laughs> I'll, I'll, find, I'll find somewhere where they don't try that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that topic was brought to you by Audible. Do you love books but find that you never have time to read them? Well, audible.com is the perfect solution. Get audiobooks and listen to those books you've been meaning to read while on the go, at the gym, during your commute. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs Excel from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. Their app is free and works on iPhones, iPad, Android, and I can't believe this, Windows Phone. You also <laughs> download and listen on your... Can
Kindle Fire and over 500 MP3 players. And unlike a streaming or rental service with, with Audible, you own your books so you can access them anytime, anywhere, right from your smartphone. Audible.com also has a great listen guarantee. If you decide you don't like the book you chose, no worries. You can exchange it anytime you're unhappy for another title, anytime, no questions asked. And just for <laughs> listeners, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. So go to Audible.com slash KF Games today to start your free trial today. Again, show your support for Kind of Funny Games and get a free 30-day trial at Audible.com forward slash KF Games. That was for you, Colin. You know how I feel about that. I do. I, I hate do. forward slash. Yeah. Just slash. No one's on. using the other slash. Yeah. Audible.com no slash KF Games. No one's making. No one's writing a URL. No one. Except in for the Nick. 21st century. Nick Scarpino. Hitting the other, you know. Oh my God. It's a whole thing. Steve. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. This has been fascinating. I said this is one of the better games cast. Yeah. <laughs> overall. This one was really worth the dollar. Yeah. This one's worth the dollar. It's been it's been really fun. Thanks Gone Home is worth the money too. Go get yes. Gone Home. All right. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I love you guys all very, very much. We'll see you next week. See you, you sons of guns. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck's trying? <laughs>